and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by the only man I know that thinks as fast as Trent Alexander-Arnold. <laughs> His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. It's very high praise. We don't usually go high praise at the beginning of the show. I like I'll to, take that. Thank I like you. to compliment you to start. I think it makes, it makes for a good show. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so we are here to talk mm-hmm. about Liverpool's 4-0 win over Barcelona in the Champions League semi-final second leg. I'll be honest, Taylor. I didn't think we'd be doing this. Uh, nor did I. I think we had prepared listener questions in mm-hmm. case. Uh, Ryan and I talked about it on Monday. I think you agreed with us that like it felt like maybe, like oh, Liverpool kind of doing okay, and then Lionel Messi gets a goal in the 20th yeah. minute, kind of kills the tie-off, because mm-hmm. then uh, Liverpool would have needed five. Yep. Maybe based on today's performance, they could have gotten five. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so we, we, were, yeah, we were expecting to analyze one or two Messi goals, yep. and a, like, a brave effort from Liverpool, but mm-hmm. well done. Very briefly, right? And then listen to questions. Instead, Liverpool pulled it off. Sure We're going to talk about all four goals. Again, you reminded me after this game, it's not just that it's the, the comeback and the turnaround, it's that Liverpool beat Barcelona by yeah. four goals. And that this has happened to them four years in a row that they've had. Who's them? Uh, Barcelona have had like strong results and then end up kind of choking it away. Last year against Roma being mm. the obvious one, we thought that wouldn't be likely this time. I think we ended our uh, last review show by saying, yeah, but even then Roma had the away goal. Yeah, yeah. That was a big difference. Here, Liverpool were just fine without it. So we'll get to all four goals. Mm-hmm. Well, first, maybe I think it's worth starting with tactics because yeah. I I would submit, and it's very hard to, for you to make a counter argument. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to guess you agree. Jurgen Klopp got this one right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what did Jurgen Klopp do that was so correct? I think he learned from the mistakes of the first leg. I think in the first leg, Liverpool pressed at times, but there were also big chunks where they sat off and they were a little bit more conservative. Yes. And I think that was part of the game plan to sit off, be conservative, hit on the break, frustrate, and see mm-hmm. what happens. And Barca didn't fall for it, right? No. Barca instead were conservative themselves, mm-hmm. and Liverpool never. Ever got to counter attack. Mm-hmm. And I think, and we talked about it then, that when you change, when you try to change your stripes, it's going to be problematic because uh-huh. it's a thing that you've worked on the whole season to suddenly try to change it up or have little incremental change. It still is different than what you yep. usually do. Here we saw what Liverpool usually do to the maximum degree. Yes. I don't want to say on steroids because that would imply it was illegal, and it was not, <laughs> but it was amped up considerably. It was turned to 11. <laughs> As someone who has recently taken mm-hmm. steroids, like doctor prescribed, um, I actually think it's a fitting, <laughs> a fitting, a fitting uh, analogy I, or imagery. I mean, we saw some uh, unexplainable rage, like Andy Robertson <laughs> shoving Little Messi in the head in the first minute. That yeah. seemed a little bit yeah. like a, a rage moment. <laughs> so here's, here's what I'd say. I'd say in some ways, Jurgen Klopp's hand was forced by the three nil deficit because mm-hmm. you can't say, "All right, Barcelona are dangerous. We're three goals down." We'll sit back and hit them on the counter and we'll probably get three or four goals that way. I think it basically, given the situation, it was we have to go after them all the time, press all the time, win the ball back all the time, be aggressive all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's either going to end in us losing 3-0 or more or worse again, or we might pull off a miracle. Yeah. Right? And I think that it was like a roll of all Jurgen Klopp's dice and he... Not got lucky, but it worked. There's another version of this game where it doesn't work, right? Where Barcelona pass their way through Liverpool's mm-hmm. press and Messi does score in like the 11th minute. Yeah. I'm not, I know you just said they didn't get lucky, but I would say like anybody who thinks that or thought that or like that Jurgen Klopp just happened to stumble upon this, I would say completely wrong because this is a, an amazing example of how much these players, I think, believe in Jurgen Klopp, how yes. much he believes in them. Mm-hmm. Because you're right. I mean, this is a miracle. To get four goals against <laughs> this Barcelona team, uh, no one predicted this. Even uh. even like most Liverpool fans, I think, at best, are like, maybe, possibly, but it seems very yeah. unlikely. And I think— I will say, they all showed up. All the fans? Yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, all, as did all the players, and I mean that, again, turned to 11. And I think that shows you the difference right there is I think every single player on that field for Liverpool tonight thought, there's a chance we can do this. We got to go yeah. 110%. And I think Barcelona thought, like, I'm not, I don't even mean this as negatively as it's about to sound, but I think thought a little bit, come on, we're Barcelona. Like, we're going <laughs> to, like, like, we're going to be okay. And I think that they, didn't necessarily get rattled right away. I think when the second goal goes in, that's when Barcelona get rattled. But I think they weren't quite at that level of intensity because I think... Because they had three goals to the Exactly. I think you think like, ah, yeah, you guys might go for it for a little bit, but we'll find a way through. Mm -hmm. And I think just that level of disparity in terms of energy in those first couple minutes, it sets the tone and it makes it hard for Barcelona, I think, to get back up to that level after that. I would say Liverpool's maybe belief Mm -hmm. um, symbolized by Mohamed Salah, couldn't play in this game. Neither could Roberto Firmino. Mm-hmm. Um, his T-shirt, which he very noticeably, he had his hoodie zipped open so you could see his T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Even though it looked pretty cold in Liverpool, it said never give up. Yeah. Right? I think never give up. So, yeah, I think it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh. I mean that's, that's one way it symbolized. I would uh-huh. say just the amount of, like, 
not even reckless tackles, not even like crazy tackles, just sort of like last ditch has to kind of happen mm-hmm. tackles that went into this one. And just aggression, just yeah. pure aggression. And actually, this is what I want to talk about because mm-hmm. I, I think in, this, in one way it's simplistic to say, oh, Liverpool were really aggressive, mm-hmm. Liverpool pressed. This is not the normal Liverpool press, right? This is different to what we normally yeah. see Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp teams do. Yes. You said it was turned to 11. I, I kind of want to ask you to explain sure. why, because if people are not that familiar, not as familiar yeah. as you are, then they might not know. I think it was usually what we've talked about when we talk about gang and press and when we talk about the press that we've seen from Liverpool under Jurgen Klopp. It is aggressive stepping to the player with the ball to cause them problems to limit time and space. But the key aspect of it is not over pursuing. If you yes. run at that player and get beat, you've kind of negated the entire system because now someone else has to come over to try to help. Their player is now open and it kind of can be a change. And then reaction. your press gets broken, right? Yeah. And you get counted on. Yeah. And I think they abandoned that a little bit in this game. It felt like so many decisions were, I keep trying to come up with an analogy and I'm struggling, but it's like it, they weren't necessarily planned, but it was sort of if the ball went back to Jordi, uh, to Jordi Alba, I was the first one to do it, uh, to Jordi Alba and Trent Alexander Arnold had to make a choice between do I track the run from Felipe Coutinho, even if it means like leaving Jordi Alba or do I step to Jordi Alba and potentially leave that ball on for Coutinho yeah. they chose to go after Jordi Alba every yes. time and I'm not saying that they isolated Jordi Alba I'm saying that I think the the uh, the philosophy switched from sit back a little bit at times pressure but don't get over like don't get exposed it yeah. turned into stop the attack before the attack happens uh-huh. and, I, and I'd go one further and say the it used to be like you go and pressure but you kind of stop short. You almost like stop in front of the player Mm -hmm. and then you force them into maybe a bad pass. But it seemed to me more often than not, or at least half the time, the plan was go charging into him. Risk getting beat, go charging into him. And I think the success of this Liverpool performance is that they went charging into people many, many times. And most of the time, they came away with the ball. Or if they didn't, they at least Made came, it real hard. came away with like fabric from a Barcelona player's yes. uniform. Because no one just got nutmegged when they went no. charging in and got stepped around and the whole thing was ruined. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, again, go back to that one in the first minute where it's, I think Messi gets the ball, it's uh, Robertson trying to get it, then it's Fabinho trying to get it, and yeah. Fabinho ends up with a slide tackle. Robertson then does the shove to Messi afterwards. But again, it's Messi getting hit, knocked around in the first minute. Um, and they eventually stop him and eventually win the ball, right? Yeah, yeah. The other sequence that really stood out was Jordan Henderson comes like crush tackle flying in on Sergio Roberto. It maybe could have been a card, maybe could have been a booking, could have been really bad if he doesn't get the ball, but he does get the ball. He also gets Sergio Roberto. Mm-hmm. Less than a minute later, uh, James Milner clears out Luis Suarez. Yep. And again, it's partially Luis Suarez is turning and has kind of gotten away from James Milner, so the foul has to happen. Yeah. But it's also not just a foul like, oh, okay, I'll pull his shirt back, oh, I'll knock him over a little bit. Like He knocks Luis Suarez to the ground, yes. and you start to see those Barcelona players get madder and madder and more frustrated, mm-hmm. and Lionel Messi, the opposite. You see him, we've seen this before with him, specifically with Argentina, when he gets knocked around a lot and he gets frustrated with his teammates and the kind of like lack of quickness in their, in their play, in their playing style, he starts to get frustrated and he starts to get more and more static. Mm-hmm. And especially in the second half, I think Liverpool did a really good job of frustrating Lionel Messi to the point where we watched, what, like a five-minute chunk where he doesn't really leave a 10 or 15-yard area in the middle of the field. He's just walking around. That is very different from the first and leg. gesticulating frustratedly, which exactly. is not a word, but I just made no. it a word. And, <laughs> I, like, I like it. And speaking of Messi, if you'll uh, f- permit me to continue with the tactics for I'm a moment. I'm not sure I have any choice, so let's go. <laughs> you don't. Uh, the other thing that I think was fundamentally different about this Liverpool team from the first leg, uh, maybe this is a thing they've done this season and we just haven't noticed it, but uh, they were in their usual 4-3-3 for the most part, but around the mm-hmm. 25th minute, there were times when it resembled more of a 4 2 3, one and the confusing slash interesting thing there was that Fabinho was not part of the two. He de- definitely looked yep. more to be stepping into the number 10 role and really stepping forward to cause pressure. I think this is the key to the game. Yep. I honestly do. So yeah, it's, again, 4 3 3 Fabinho is what you would call, or we in America Mm-hmm. Called the number six. I think in Brazil they say number five, but mm. um, he's the deepest of the three. So it's almost like a triangle, right? With Fabinho deep, and it would have been Milner and Henderson like flanking him. Um, and then he would just pop out between mm-hmm. them and he would go pressure like Sujo Busquets or Leo Messi if he was up there. And it seems to me that Fabinho was just essentially given license to, hey, when you feel like stepping out of that defensive midfield role and just going and either winning the ball or, to be frank, wrecking someone. He mm-hmm. gets that yellow card for that tackle on Luis Suarez in the 11th minute. Fabinho was just given license to do whatever he thought was the best thing to do. And Fabinho made all the right calls because he was always pressuring uh, Barcelona's deeper midfielders. Mm-hmm. And then he was also also somehow always back in the actual defensive midfield spot 
when Liverpool needed him. Yeah. He did both jobs. He Incredible. did. Incredible. And I think, but I think another like key part of that was that when Fabinho would step to say Sergio Busquets and say Lionel Messi had stayed further forward, Virgil Van Dijk seemed to be the one who was tasked with. Okay, if Fabinho yes. goes, you step to Lionel Messi. Yeah, and, there was you know, definitely a plan, right? Yep. There was definitely mm-hmm. a plan. And so you don't need, like he doesn't even track him all the way to midfield or anything like that. It's just I think they keep letting Messi know, hey, we're here. There's a little bump. Mm-hmm. There's a little touch. There's a little step. There's just that sort of presence of another player. I think he never was able to kind of find himself in the space that we're accustomed to seeing Lionel Messi in. And neither was Sergio Busquets. And that's kind of like the, the spine of Barcelona's creativity yeah. and intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. So if you think of if Fabinho was sitting deeper, there's a little like valley almost in midfield for Barca to fill and run into. And Fabinho stopped that by stepping out. I think it's a key tactical wrinkle that Klopp and Fabinho employed that made the entire difference in this game. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I would still, though, add that there's a dash of like belief in there that yes, you have definitely. to have because we've seen it before when teams try, and we've been in teams where like if half the team is stepping aggressively, but maybe a couple players are a little bit slow to, to cover – then those gaps open up and suddenly that press is negated. Yeah. Routinely, especially in the first 10 or 15 minutes, the tone was set of ball goes back to Ter Stegen or Ter Stegen takes a goalkeeper short, and, or goal kick short rather, and you just see but Liverpool have everybody committed forward. So there is not a single Barcelona player open. It necessitates a long ball out of the back. Virgil van Dijk is usually going to win those, especially mm-hmm. if he's matched up against Lionel Messi. But even against Suarez, the only time I think Suarez wins one, quote unquote, is when he backs into Virgil van Dijk and then dives forward That's very after Suarez, he right? got a lot of knocks and so I yeah. think the referee was inclined to give him that one but again that my point there is that that still isn't Luis Suarez beating Virgil van Dijk in the air because very few people are going to do that and once van Dijk wins that it's maybe a 50-50 ball for Barcelona at best more likely it's Liverpool collecting the ball and re-establishing possession and Barcelona basically and can't here breathe here we go again yeah. alright before we get to an ad break and then talk about the goals I want to mm-hmm. talk you mentioned it a couple of times Andy Robertson yep. in the first couple of minutes does that thing off the ball after a messy counter attack has been stopped mm-hmm. uh, by Fabinho's slide tackle I think um Video shows uh, Robertson, two hands, pushes Messi in the back of the head as Messi's sitting on the floor. My question to you, should Andy Robertson have been sent off in the first few minutes? I thought there was a decent argument to be made that yes, he should have been. Because it was my understanding, hands to the head or face... That's automatically going to be striking, a red card, right? Isn't it called striking? Uh, we I reached out to our referee friend uh, who referees professional games. Uh-huh. Uh, he said, "We're we not naming him. Uh, we're not okay. Uh, uh, a player who, when not challenging for the ball, deliberately strikes an opponent or any other person on the head or face with the hand or arm is guilty of violent conduct unless the force used was negligible." Mm. Uh, referee continues by the book. I'd say that's not negligible and probably red in a domestic league. It's red in major league soccer. It's red in a UEFA semifinal. It is never a red, especially in the first minute as conf- <laughs> and this is where it gets i think it gets, it gets confusing because would heineken be mad is that right I, yeah i think so no i think i think it's, <laughs> it gets confusing because like there's a, the old debate of if it's a penalty in the first minute or if it's a penalty in the 90th minute it's a penalty in the first minute vice versa mm-hmm. i think his point here is that in that first minute the referee of the var crew is probably looking at it as was it really intended to be malicious? Was it more of a like, oh, get up sort of thing? And I think basically if it comes down to the shove, not necessarily being a strike, but more of a shove, mm-hmm. then you can sort of debate how physical it was. Right, it seemed like slap him on the head. It was yeah. like a push with two two hands, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, but I, he did said... Did talk to Andy Robertson? He did, right? I had a chat with him afterwards. I think. He did. I But see, that was where I can't tell if that was the VAR crew said like, hey, he shoved him and you might want to have a word. Because uh-huh. to me, he would look at that. I think it's that Messi and Robertson continued to jaw at each other and there was mm-hmm. a little bit of a coming together uh, off camera before the I think it was a Liverpool corner happened and I think that's I think he was really just saying like hey you two need to calm down and maybe didn't quite know but I think there's also an argument to be made that he didn't want to be accused of kind of ruining, ruining the fixture yeah. by sending off a player in the first minute for an incident he didn't see and you gotta say Andy I mean I wouldn't have done what Andy Robertson did I don't think he should have done what he did no. but given the fact that he got away with it Got to intimidate Messi a bit. Yeah. It kind of works, right? It's a bit like the whole Liverpool gamble paid off. The yeah. pushing Messi in the head paid off for Andy Robertson. But yeah, but there's another narrative. I mean, I guess this is how it always is. The world can like, exist in two, two realities where yeah. like Robertson does that and it's Messi's gotten in his head and now Robertson's being overly aggressive and maybe he bumps it again and then it is a red card. And like mm-hmm. it could have easily been the other way around. It just wasn't on the day. All right, all this talking has made me mm-hmm. hungry. All right. So I want to talk about today's Let's sponsor. Uh, today's show is sponsored by HelloFresh, a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook 
eat and enjoy. HelloFresh is like a food butler in a box. <laughs> a food butler in a box. Yeah. All right. That is not their official copy. That's what I'm going with. No, but I, I take your they point. They go shopping for you. Like, they put it in a box. They deliver it to your house. Everything comes like neatly organized. Yeah. So it does feel like it's been put together with care the way yep. you would expect a butler to do it. The way but Jeffrey then, from Fresh Prince would. Uh, yeah, is it? Jo- I always want to go Joffrey, but you're right. It's, it's definitely not Jeffrey. Joffrey. He, had, he did have an evil bone in his butt. Okay, I think is his name Jeffrey Butler. I think his name is Jeffrey Butler. No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but yes, and then it's like you have the instructions and the step by step guide with the pictures. It helps you sort of in the way that I imagine a butler would help you if you were cooking. I really appreciate <laughs> the, the guide and the pre measured ingredients with the easy to follow recipe cards because I like cooking. I tend to kind of improvise a little bit. Uh, I am. I think I'm, I'm decently good at improvising when it comes to being in the kitchen. But that, Yeah, I'd agree with that. I've seen you at work. But that then kind of lends itself to using the same spices, the same kind of key ingredients, because those are the ones you're more familiar with. Yeah. But with HelloFresh, you get different ingredients, different types of cuisine mm-hmm. that you then learn how to cook, and then it becomes part of your repertoire. You expand your ability as a result. I, I genuinely think that's true. Yeah, I've been introduced to things that I did not know about uh, mm-hmm. via HelloFresh. Uh, it makes conquering the kitchen a reality with deliciously <laughs> simple recipes. Uh I would agree with that. I am not good at following instructions. I tried to put furniture together. It goes wrong. I was reading the instruction book and get really frustrated. With the recipe cards for HelloFresh, I felt like it was within my reach to follow them correctly and not be at the end like... Why is there a leftover screw? You know what I mean? There were yeah. no equivalents of leftover screws or anything like that when I did the HelloFresh recipes. It, it looked like the picture when I'd finished. How and, about that? And we do know that like, <laughs> when uh, we've asked people before, they've helpfully informed us that like, when a player subs on and they're flipping through the book, a lot of that is like set. Like you see the, the player with the <laughs> yeah, coach. Set piece instructions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like maybe HelloFresh did a little bit of set piece instruction in this game because <laughs> it allowed them to conquer Barcelona, them being Liverpool. Yeah. But it was also kind of a step-by-step guide for how to uh, – kind of exploit a vulnerability and make something good happen. Oh, there you we'll go. Get, we'll get to all that soon enough. Mm-hmm. Um, all the meals come together in 30 minutes max. Yep. Call for less than two pots and pans and require minimal cleanups. If you have two pots and pans, uh, you, can, you can make a HelloFresh recipe. There are three plans to choose from. Classic, veggie, that would be mine, and family, um, with the option to switch between those three plans uh, for when your tastes change or, I guess, the size of your family changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You can spend less time meal planning and grocery shopping so you can get that time back to do more of what you love, which is, uh, for me, watch soccer and watch Game of Thrones. Uh, that's, and so, you know, you want to get <laughs> the meal Prince. done. Don't you don't want to get Prince. that dra- dragging on. I cannot remember the last time I watched a Fresh Prince episode. <laughs> um, yes, so HelloFresh makes that nice and easy, and it makes it easy for our listeners to get $80 off their first month of HelloFresh by going to hellofresh.com slash Daryl. TSS80. Thank you. I'm and sure I'm sure you definitely knew, right? You didn't throw it to me just because you didn't know. I wrote it down right here. Uh, <laughs> and enter promo code TSS80 at checkout. One more time, that's hellofresh, TS, hellofresh.com slash TSS80. Mm-hmm. I nearly got it wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and then enter the promo code TSS80. It's like receiving eight, I mean, excuse me, it's like receiving eight meals for free because it's $20 off your first four boxes. All right. Thank you very much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's episode. We've talked a bit about the tactics, a bit about the, about the approach. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about some goals. Yeah, enough tactics. Let's talk balls in All back right. of nets. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, and let's start in the seventh minute, which is when Liverpool get their first goal. Um, and it is interesting because it essentially comes from uh, Jordi Alba winning a header. And like we <laughs> saw him be a major threat for Barcelona in the first leg. He was the hero of the first leg, right? Not so much for this one. Not left. so much yeah. for this one. Uh, and it is interesting that it comes about from Jordi Alba trying to get committed for it, and basically Barcelona turned the ball over, so he's trying to get back at a position when there's a long ball from Joel Matip, a wide looking for Sadio Mane. But that said, I was ready to think it was like, oh, Jordi Alba's out of position, he's sprinting back, and that's why he has such a bad play. I genuinely don't know why this is such a poorly hit header from uh, Jordi Alba. So he's going for Lengle, right? Mm -hmm. Lengle, excuse me. He's trying to head it back to Lengle. Mm -hmm. Sadio Mane is like wide of Alba. So maybe this is the classic thing where Liverpool were just on it, were more aggressive, and were just getting to things with more um, determination and just will to win than than seemed possible to Barcelona. I think you're right. Is that too simplistic? No. No, but a little bit only only to say that I think it's like it's another example what I, we've kind of been like stumbling upon or at least I've been stumbling upon in this review is like it's like 99% this thing from Liverpool and then 1% this extra little thing. And in this case, yeah, it's it's Sajid Mane like being attuned to what's about to happen and aggressively trying to win that ball. But it's 1% deception, I think, because he does sort of look as though like, oh, I was waiting for that long ball to come over the top and I was going to receive it on the touchline. It didn't quite get to me. It's actually a really badly underhit ball from yeah. the team, right? But I think Sajid Mane makes it look like, 
oh, you're going to cut this ball out, so I'm not even going to go for it. I'm going to mess it. I'm just going to be like, oh. Yeah. Enough. And then Jordi Alba, I think, is like, <laughs> okay, cool. I've, I can calmly head this ball back to Langley. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as he kind of commits to doing that, Sajaman is alive to it and just intercepts a, an under-hit header. But I think an under-hit header because Jordi Alba was kind of fooled in that moment. Could, I want to say we both noticed this, right? Sajaman got to a lot of things mm-hmm. that he didn't seem to have an actual physical possibility of getting to. Yeah. And he always just managed to get a toe there first. Yes. If this were a Game of Thrones episode, I would have been frustrated by how many times things happened at the very last <laughs> second and kept working out. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, and, and that's that's the case here because it's Sajamani wins it, lays it off to Jordan Henderson. Oh, he almost like gently lifts it over somebody, yeah. right? It's a really clever little pass. It is, but then it's Henderson kind of goes on a run, gets a little bit fortunate, I think, with the way the ball ends up spilling, but he's able to get the shot off of his Oh, no, left he foot. has a nice little swivel in there. Oh, I'm but there's really impressed. definitely a like miscontrol, like, like a, an attempt at a slide tackle there's an attempt at a poke clearance and All it just right. kind of like I think it gets poked into Henderson's foot and it goes back into, into place so okay. that he's able to left foot it it's a good save I think from Ter Stegen it's not a great shot from Henderson it's right? Not. I think he kind of hits it too central and he was trying to go far post mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think a lot of times as we saw in this game when it's sort of the goalkeepers trying to guess what's going to happen something has come out of nothing basically yeah, yeah. You're lucky to get a hand to it at all. In this case, he does well to keep it out, Ter Stegen, but Divac Origi is there, and most importantly, is there on side. He is. Uh, when the shot is taken, he's definitely on side, and he easily slots it home 1 0 Liverpool. Yeah, uh, Origi had done a good job of just like hanging to the uh, mm-hmm. uh, to PK's right, essentially. Yeah. So he's never quite in PK's full field of view, and he can just kind of hang out at the back post yeah. and be ready for when that, if, yeah. if that pops loose. Which, of course, it does. It does. So it's Origi being like aware of the moment, making sure to stay on side, and then finishing. It would have been difficult to miss that one. But it's also, I want to go back to Jordan Henderson for a moment, because it's not just that he goes on the kind of slaloming run, eventually gets the shot off, forces the save. It's also that he's there in the first place, that as soon as Sajamani looks like he's going to win this ball, yeah. Henderson is aggressively stepping forward. He read Salah's t shirt yeah. and just went, I'm going for it. But uh, yeah, I mean, but I mean, <laughs> I think that, like, I doubt that's what happened, but I think that's a representative of what we're talking about, that it's like as soon as it looks like maybe they're going to win the ball back the Liverpool players are charging forward and even if they don't now they've committed numbers forward and now like even if uh, I don't know Lengley is able to win that ball back Jordan Henderson is now running at him full speed and he's got to kind of make a desperation pass or eventually just kick it out of bounds so I think that sort of alertness from Liverpool yep. consistently caused problems for Barcelona all right and then mm-hmm. half time we get a change from Liverpool we do Andy Robertson comes off. Mm-hmm. I think he's slightly injured himself, yeah. right? I think it was like he overextends or maybe just gets clipped a little bit, falls awkwardly. Either way, uh, running with some discomfort. We thought it was going to be Jordan Henderson who gets subbed off. Because yeah, because he, he was really limping, right? Yeah, we thought maybe he had like torn a ligament in his knee or something mm-hmm. like that because it was a non, it was non-contact. Even though it looked like there was contact, it was on the other knee. He's holding the right knee. Then he comes back in and maybe just adrenaline plays through it. <laughs> yeah. Andy Robertson could I not. genuinely wouldn't be surprised if Henderson is injured for the weekend. And yeah. adrenaline did get him through this second half. Uh, no, also, so, not a doctor. Um, so, yeah, Rob- Robertson comes off at half time. James Milner, excuse me, Hammers Milner goes back to left back. Giorgio Wijnaldum mm-hmm. comes in. And obviously, this is key because Giorgio Wijnaldum scores the next two goals. He does. Is there a weird thing where we don't think of Giorgio Wijnaldum as a goal scorer, yet he keeps scoring goals? Well, I think. I think maybe, but I think part of that is because if he had just been playing midfield in our minds, we would think like, yeah, he scores goals from midfield. I yeah. think it's that he played the last leg as a replacement for Firmino. Yeah, it's a weird that we think forward. of like, well, is he a forward then? And maybe he should have scored more. Mm-hmm. So yes, to see him come on and score two goals shouldn't be surprising, but I think it was because of the way the first leg went. Okay, and the great thing about this uh, this first goal mm-hmm. from Giorgio Ronaldo is kind of Trent Alexander-Arnold. Yes. This is the one where TAA, as I mm-hmm. like to call him, um, like heads the ball in field. And it's not a great header, no. right? It's, it's picked off. But then immediately, Liverpool counter press, activate. Yeah. Right? I think, I think Henderson is there. Someone else is there. They're all swarming around Barcelona as they, as they try to, uh, to start moving the ball. And as the, I can't remember who passes it. Rakitic. But Rakitic plays it out left to Jordi Alba. Mm-hmm. Um, excuse me. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. To Jordi Alba. And immediately, maybe even just before it's, the it's pass. before Rakitic even so he plays reads it, it yep. right? Trent Alexander-Arnold, again, as we talked about at the top of the show, mm-hmm. He's not worried about what's behind him. He's worried about going forward and winning that ball. And he gets there first, wins the ball, and off he goes down the right yeah. wing. And then again, it, it's I think it's get down to like the end line, maybe force a corner, which is what he does later on, yeah, yeah. or maybe just get that ball into the box and see what happens because you've caught Barcelona in a state where they're transitioning back. Yeah. As it's classic gag impress, right? Yeah, it's as, almost like uh, Alexander Arnold deliberately had a bad header so that they could gag impress in that corner. I'm not saying that's what really what happened, but it kind of worked out nicely. That'd be some next level. Yeah, some next level stuff there. Doubt it happened. 
happen though. But yes, and so if you've got Barcelona suddenly kind of collapsing back on their own goal, people trying to find space, mm-hmm. figure out who they're marking, that is when you want to just fire a ball into the box and see what happens. That's what Trent Alexander-Arnold does. It is helped in this case by taking a slight deflection off of Ivan Rakitic. Off which, his butt, right? Yeah, which basically puts <laughs> it perfectly into the path of Georgia, uh, Gigi Wijnaldum. So yeah, he's aiming for Sadio Mane, mm-hmm. right? And it's kind of a low percentage yep. ball because there's a few defenders in the way. And yeah, it does get maybe lucky that it hits Rakitic and bounces. I don't think Wijnaldum even really has to change stride except for a last minute sl- acceleration. I think he slows up a little bit and then accelerates through it. Yeah. So it's an element of luck here, right? Yeah. That it lands in the path of Gigi Wijnaldum who can like side yep. foot finish it first time. I would also say... You want to maybe blame someone for not tracking Wijnaldum or something? Arturo Vidal is with him every step of the way, and he is sort of... He's accelerating as much as he did when he was drunk driving. Yeah. He is fully, <laughs> fully after him. Even no slides in at the end. When Adam is just that little bit ahead of him, that little bit get there first, and that little bit ball in the back of the net. Yeah. Two nothing. I would say Vidal was even slightly more uh, in charge of his faculties <laughs> this time around. Uh, but yeah, but, but, and again, it's, it's sort of, it looks like Ter Stegen maybe could have done better because he does get a hand to it, but it still goes in. But again, I think that's one where he's kind of doing the best he can in that moment because it's been a turnover because that ball is kind of zipped in and it takes that deflection. Yeah. I think Ter Stegen Hagen is worried about getting back into the kind of center of goal, getting good position, and then that shot comes. It's a little bit congested. Maybe he can't see it clearly. Is able to get a hand to it, but I, I think the power as well that uh, when Adam strikes that ball with, it makes it very difficult for Ter Stegen to keep out, and he doesn't. So and it's 2-0. That's the 50th minute. It's 2-0. Liverpool are still one 54th, goal, yeah. one goal yeah. behind. In the 56th minute, yeah. Gigi and Adam has that header. I think, weirdly, the header is not the most... Or at least for our like tactical thesis, the header's not the most impressive thing. It's what Liverpool do from yep. Barcelona's kickoff, which is the most uh, yeah. impressive thing. And right? it's what we've been talking about. It's basically from kickoff. Uh, there's, it's not like it just happens automatically. There is definitely a moment when you can tell that Barcelona don't quite know what they're going to do with the ball. It kind of mm-hmm. moves back and then over to the right. And this is when it's that moment of indecision. That's when Fabinho aggressively steps to Busquets. Virgil van Dijk moves out and is on Lionel Messi. Barcelona for, try to force that ball into Messi. It gets to him, but Virgil van Dijk is right there, puts him under pressure, Liverpool able to get the ball back right away. Yeah, doesn't van Dijk sort of tackle him and it pops in the air and yeah. maybe Henderson picks it off on the way? That sounds about right. Liverpool are away. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think it's just amazing that we even talk about Messi getting tackled because it happened a lot this game. It doesn't usually happen no. all that much. He normally finds a way to shake someone off, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I was think- really impressed with van Dijk's decision-making and just ability to win the ball when he mm-hmm. does it. Yeah. And I think, it, and I think it's because that second goal doesn't necessarily come out of nowhere, but it does come after Barcelona had a lot of good uh, scoring opportunities at yeah. the end of the first half. Well, especially Sonny Allison saves it. We haven't really talked about it as part no, of this, right? And that's kind of, in the game and that's kind of why I'm going back. Uh, forgive me doing, for doing fine, some, like, yeah. mid-goal breakdown. But like it's <laughs> worth noting, 51st minute, Luis Suarez is in on goal. Allison makes that save. That's and a great messy pass, actually. It was. Yeah. And it was a great save. It was not a very well-taken shot. And I do feel like Barcelona had a few moments where they were either slightly indecisive in their finishing. They were trying to pick their spot instead of just kind of hitting it first time and backing them themselves and there were moments uh, there's the one like the 16th that I think would have ended up being offside but it's the one where Barcelona keep trying to pass the ball in the box even though there's four of them and two defenders and they still don't end up scoring even if they'd been offside it still is like Ooh, you guys don't seem like you're kind of up for the occasion. And even uh, when they were, Allison was more than ready to handle it. And that's why I would still argue there's an element of Liverpool gambled and yeah. won. But this was the only the only hand they could have played was to gamble big, right? Absolutely. So you go conservative, you maybe win one nil, mm-hmm. and then it's like, oh, nice. And then yeah. then we're answer, we're answering listening to questions today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm glad we're not doing that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did just want to give Ali some his due because there yes. were some moments when Messi is one of the first half where he hits it kind of like co- towards the top corner. Allison gets a hand to it, puts it out for a corner, oh, yeah. and I think it's. It's one of those where, like, there's no saves that are, like, spectacular or amazing. There's some very good saves from Allison, but it's a lot of goalkeepers making, like, good, competent saves that you need them to make to kind of get that confidence going. Uh-huh. And if you're Barcelona, if you take five shots and the keeper gets all of them, there is that moment where you start to wonder, like, oof, is this, can, why can't I get by this guy? And so and then it, when you have that very good chance for Suarez, if he's already missed one or two, he might just not be quite as, like, 100% confident as he normally would be, and then he overthinks it and ends up shooting it uh, a little wider than I think he would have liked. And then to double down on this, this idea of confidence, mm-hmm. get into this third goal. That yep. We've already broken it down, but the fact that it starts with Leo Messi yep. getting tackled by Virgil van Dijk, it just has a thing to it, right? Of it like, does. oh, uh, our prince that was promised <laughs> is tackled by that big Dutch dude. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, and I mean, it is from this. It's Barcelona, or excuse me, Liverpool will play it wide. The Van right. Dijk King. The ball, I think, gets crossed in. Terrible. Ball gets crossed in, collected on the opposite side. I think Shakiri chases it down, plays it to Hamas Milner. Hamas Milner plays it back to Shakiri. Yep. Shakiri crosses it in for Wijnaldum. And Wijnaldum scores. And when we watched this live, we both thought, he is 
very open for yeah. the man who just scored the goal a minute ago. And there's really a lot of Barcelona players around him, but no one is marking him. Yeah. And I think that might be the trick that Wijnaldum pulled, yep. was to be so close to everybody, but not marked by anybody. Mm-hmm. There's literally, so I wrote this down, there's a triangle of Pique, mm-hmm. Lenglet, and Rakitic. just ahead of them, Rakitic. And then Wijnaldum is literally in the middle. It's like a Bermuda Triangle situation. Yep. Like he disappeared in the middle of those guys. It's a Wijnaldum Triangle. It's a thing we <laughs> sometimes see with Lionel Messi. It's diffusion of responsibility. Yeah. It's when you get three defenders around a player everybody thinks well I don't want to be the one to dive in because I'm not sure if I'm the one that's supposed to be marking and you can see Rakitic sort of looking at Wijnaldum and then looking at the two defenders and thinking oh well they're goal side they're in stronger positions yeah I'll be here in case it's like under hit or the ball kind of pops out but I think everybody is kind of focused on other things especially because this comes from a cross that didn't connect and then kind of goes in and then back out to that other side yeah so I think everyone's again trying to get back into position but as a result, no one is really marking Wijnaldum. And I do also think that part of that is that it's not uh, a, a it's not Daniel Sturridge in there at, at this moment. It's mm-hmm. a maybe a player that you don't necessarily think of if you're Barcelona as being that like, oh, it's a center forward who's going to yeah. try to outjump us and score this <laughs> it's goal. It's the guy who played center forward last weekend. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I would also maybe, I, I might need to rewatch this again, but I have questions about Tesh Dagen in this moment. Okay. I think he's too far over to the other side. So he's almost like... Facing like he's leaning the wrong way. When yeah. Wijnaldum heads it back across goal, to Stegen's like scrambling. He's already leaning the wrong way, and he can't get there. And I also wonder if maybe he should have come for the cross. I mean, possibly. But I think this is this is the most panicked I've seen Barcelona in a yeah. long time. That's this, a huge this, element of it. This right? goal to me is just sort of like, oh, we gave it away, and now we're all scrambling, and we don't mm-hmm. quite know where to be, and everyone thinks they've got it. And we've been in those positions where you kind of think like, okay, we've kind of like calmed it down, yeah. we stopped the bleeding, Everybody it's going to be okay. And then they score again, yep. and suddenly you feel like you have no idea how to deal with things. I'm confused about what Barcelona did next. Mm-hmm. They didn't like say, all right, we're going to turn it on and go back at you. They no. kind of kept playing like there was still a goal ahead. Right? Well, they take off Coutinho, I think, two or three minutes after this right. third goal. So to map it out, what, uh, Semedo comes on, you got it. and uh, Vidal goes left mid, and Sergio Roberto goes there right mid. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same sort of defensive 4-4-2 shape, yeah. right? That wasn't really working. It was not. <laughs> and, and just slightly a more defensive version of it, I guess, because Coutinho is not... For all his talents, he's not that that useful a uh, like left sided defensive player. He is not, right? and so and did not have a very good game. Uh, mm-hmm. Under hits and passes, got knocked off the ball on a couple of occasions. Was pretty anonymous. Has the one shot in the first half uh, that he I think hits wide, or maybe it's uh, like pushed wide by Allison. But again, probably should have done better with it. I think another issue for Barcelona, and one that I think uh, Ernesto Valverde will come under some fire for, is that he played Usman Dembele this weekend in a game when Barcelona had already wrapped up the title. Dembele picks up a knock, cannot then play today, and I do think Dembele is a player who, yes, he missed a sitter uh, in the uh, in the first leg that he would have made buried, it 4-0. He could have buried this tie, right? Mm-hmm. Or at least made it that Liverpool had to score one more to force extra time, mm-hmm. and then we go to extra time and see what happens. But it's also the case that Usman Dembele is a player who's very fast, and maybe one of the himself and you could have used if you're Barcelona you could bring him in and sort of sit back and then try to kind of hit Liverpool as they're yep. pressing forward a little bit more they went Malcolm instead right? but they didn't have that had. option because yeah. Dembele was injured and I seem to remember when when Barcelona spoiler alert Barcelona eventually 4-0 down <laughs> there's a moment where Malcolm's like the guy who's going to run yep. at Liverpool's defense and he ends up dribbling backwards yep. and all the way back and giving it to a defender yep. yeah not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that but I know as when Dembele would not have done that Yes, no, I doubt he would have. But it's just it was it was really interesting because even I think before the fourth goal, uh, maybe even before the second goal, like Barcelona have a free kick in a very similar position. Lionel Messi taking it to uh, where he took last week when he scored that lovely free kick. And last week we both saw that and thought like this is going to be like we both were like this is going to be a goal. We didn't know why. Yep. This week I think we were both like oh, it's kind of, like I think I was like oh it's in the same spot, but it just didn't have that same feel. And I think that continued on for Barcelona that it never felt like even when they got decent chances it kind of started to feel like oh they're not going to score in this game mm-hmm. and then maybe it makes a little more sense why they were sort of playing at three nil down like okay this is what we need to do right now because we kind of don't have any answers let's get to extra yeah. time and figure some stuff out well i mean we um optimistically set the dvr mm-hmm. to add additional time we didn't i remember it. scoffing and saying as though we're gonna need extra time <laughs> and then we didn't so i guess i was right we didn't need it because of the quick thinking of a young Englishman mm-hmm. with a slight American connection yeah. called Trent Alexander hyphen Arnold. Yes. And before we get to the description, <laughs> I I'll like say, I think you should. Uh, we have been asked a couple times on Twitter uh, if this qualifies like master set piece theater, which is, if you're new to the show, is a thing that we use to kind of describe set pieces that were clearly drawn out yeah. and well orchestrated and well acted that led to uh, actually, great goals. I said yes on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Now I realize I'm 100% 
wrong? Because this was not drawn up at all. This was just um, improvising, right? Uh, I mean, yes and no. Because I do think like we've seen Liverpool score off of like the driven ball from Trent, Trent Alexander-Arnold off the corner into the box yeah. low and like somebody gets a foot to it. Usually with the, def- the opposition defense paying attention. Though, yes. Right? I th- <laughs> so I think – I honestly think this is a like sort of two things situation okay. in which I think it's probably a play that they've drawn up previously. But I don't think it's one that they were looking for in the moment. I really think it's just that Trent Alexander-Arnold is alive to Divac Origi is – wide open and unmarked and nobody on Barcelona is paying attention mm-hmm. and that's what happens right it's it's basically corner taken he play he like walks away as though he's not going to take it Trent yeah yeah then runs back and takes it really quickly finds a Shikiri's Origi. coming over to take that's it that's the thing that Shikiri gives it away has his head down as well and right? then when it's taken sort of it's not just the like ha I'm acting and I was selling it the whole time he looks behind him like what what just happened did you kick the ball why did you kick the ball and then realizes what's happened <laughs> are we winning despite all my misplaced passes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he probably wondered that a little bit. But that, that really is the thing that sells it for me. Like, And it's not even that, like, oh, maybe Jaron Shakir is a very good actor. It's just how switched off he was in that moment. To yeah. me, it says that they're not – this isn't a thing they're looking for. It's a thing that Trent Alexander-Arnold spotted and expertly took advantage of. And he just – it was – so I think this goes to the theme of the day, which is, like, Fabinho authorized to leave yep. that defensive midfield spot. And when you think, Fabinho, it's the right decision to go pressure Busquets or someone else or go slide tackling someone like crazy, mm-hmm. you go do it because we trust you. Virgil van Dijk, we trust you to step out of the back and go one-on-one with Messi when you think it's the right thing. Trent Alexander-Arnold in this moment, definitely this isn't something he's been told to no. do. And yet he just seizes the moment and uses his, his what's, what's the word, his intuition, mm-hmm. his just trust in himself to think this is the right thing to do. His carpe diemness. His carpe diemness, I'm going to take this fast, I'm going to fizz this in low. Luckily, Divock Origi, even though he's not part of the plan, I'm really confident in this, is alive to it, yep. right? Because you can see him, he's looking the whole time at the across there and then you but, but he, he kind of looks away for a minute when that ball is hit I think he sort of was like oh the ball's coming right out right. so he's not in an alert like I'm ready to yeah. shoot I'm just like I'm in shooting position the most impressive thing to me is that he's alert enough that as soon as he sees it come in he immediately switches into goal scorer mode yeah. right and you and- can see him get set side foot finish PK's reacting far too late trying to head it off the line. It's all too late because Origi was alive to Trent Alexander-Arnold's sort of uh, clairvoyance. But I would say, yeah, but I would say that I think if everybody had been alive to this opportunity in the moment, it doesn't happen because it's I too think obvious. if Origi is standing there screaming, I'm wide open, yeah, yeah, yeah. someone is going to cover him. Uh-huh. If Jordan Henderson is pointing and screaming, hey, he's wide open. If Jurgen Klopp is screaming from the sideline, someone's going to pick him up. It's just <laughs> yeah. that Trent Alexander-Arnold spots it. And then it's a credit to Divac Origi that as soon as that ball is hit, he recognizes, oh, it's coming right at me. I should probably finish this. And he does it really, really well because given like the trajectory and the angle that he hits it, he kind of side foots it, but he puts it basically top far corner. Yeah. It's a really well struck shot. Uh, and then I think the degree of difficulty magnified by the fact that I don't think he saw the ball being delivered and just reacts to it that quickly. So how much do we blame the Barcelona defense? And a I lot. Put this in our situation. Like when we can see the corner on our amateur mm-hmm. team, are we immediately always switched on? Like this could be taken at any second. Everybody get ready. Because I know I spend time looking for my mark and doing this and that. And I, in a weird way, I think it's excusable. And it's just Trent Alexander-Arnold is just ahead of the curve on this. I don't, I don't think it is. Be- and I'll say that because there is somebody for Barcelona out there. I forget who it is, but there's somebody out there to defend the short corner. Yeah. And I think that's that- why Shakiri's possibly coming over. Yeah. Well, right? And yeah. so I think that positioning is – it's either that or maybe it goes back to this weekend where they wanted to have an in-swinger as yeah. opposed to an out-swinger. Oh, so but- you have the two people then. You yeah. know which one it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. But I think if you're defending that short corner – you're not defending that short corner because it ends up being driven like straight in, in towards the goal. So I think then that player isn't really paying attention. They're not keeping good position. They're not as close to the touchline as they should be or the sideline as they should be. Oh, because you're saying part of the defensive setup is you have someone either on the end line or just slightly above it to just be a block for that low driven cross, right? Yeah. Yeah, And I mean, even like, I would say like a a backbreaker for me is that when this ball is struck, it's almost to Origi when Ter Stegen is like clapping up his defenders like, come on guys, let's get this. Let's make sure we don't concede. And then I think very quickly he's like, oh, I'm about to be scored upon and kind of dives back across to try to make a play. Yeah. But even he does not see this coming. And I think, yeah, it's Barcelona, more of Barcelona kind of not being quick enough to it, sitting back, being a little bit dazed by what's happening here, not quite understanding what's about to happen happen and then Liverpool being alive to it as quickly as possible it ends in Liverpool advancing wow all right yep. anything else to say on this game I mean the, the way Liverpool set the game for example they switch to a kind of four five one ish yep. type mm-hmm. formation right it's briefly Sadio Mane up front then I think it's Sturridge when he comes on I think it was the right thing to pull back 
at four mm-hmm. 0 because one Barcelona goal ruins the whole thing. Yeah, right? exactly. Or yeah, I guess goal. yeah. Then you got to get the one more, you and nobody fifth. wants to do yeah. that. But I'll say this: like having watched Manchester United a lot lately, I've become an expert in teams standing around and not doing much, <laughs> and that is not a thing we usually see from Barcelona. But in these final ten to fifteen minutes, it is. It's a lot of oh, Barcelona yeah, yeah, yeah. four players kind of standing on the eighteen, waiting for that ball to come into the box. One of them is Lionel Messi. Like no disrespect to him, but he's not a person who you want. Like the ball just being dumped into the box, and maybe he wins a header. He can win a header here and there. Don't get me wrong. He scored yeah. against Manchester United in the Champions League on a header. But that's not what you're looking for in those moments. You expect Barcelona to move it left to right, right to left, kind of probe fine areas, overload Ooh. a side. You don't see any of that from Barcelona in these dying moments. Is there an argument that Malcolm dribbling backwards is also because he had no options because yeah. no other Barca players were moving? Yeah. I yeah. think there's So a in a weird way, he does well just to keep hold of the ball. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the 70th minute when I wrote down, like, do Barcelona know that it's tied right now, 3-3? Because <laughs> you just see them, like, get the ball, turn around, play it back. Uh, Jared Piquet at one point, you can see him, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this. I'm going to go driving forward and kind of drives forward 10 yards and slowly makes a like circling run and then drops it back to Langley. And it's like, okay, so you just did the exact same thing. And I, yeah, I have to believe that that's partially Barcelona not wanting to take risks and risk losing the ball, mm-hmm. but it's also them not having many options to play forward too. All right. Any, any extra words you want to have on this? Nah, just I, I didn't <laughs> see this coming, but well done, Liverpool. Absolutely. It was really, as a neutral, I kind of lean England, I guess, just being English, but um, it was really enjoyable to watch here yes, in the office. We, really, really good, we had a good old time watching Liverpool do this. We sure did. <laughs> Tomorrow, we have um, Ajax hosting Spurs. Uh, Ajax with a 1-0 lead. We will, of course, be in the office mm-hmm. to watch that one. So we we're sure looking will. at a Champions League final of Liverpool versus either Ajax or Spurs. June 1st. I checked the date today. June 1st. All right, then. But before we get to the Champions League final or even that uh, Ajax Tottenham game, we should talk about today's sponsor. Yes. Away Days. Away Days. Awaydaysfootball.com. The independent clothing Mm -hmm. brand um, out of Massachusetts. But they also do the famous, the wonderful mystery kits. Mm -hmm. This is where you, uh, for $25, um, you get... A jersey, and you don't know what it's going to be. It's a team jersey. It's not from a big team. It could be from anywhere in the world. It could be Swedish, Portuguese, Greek, Turkish, anything. And if you've been listening to Total Soccer Show long enough, you know all about the mystery kits. Mm-hmm. Except you don't. Oh? Because there's a, new, there's a new type of mystery kit um, available on awaydaysfootball.com. I appreciate you playing along because I know that you already know this. I do. Um, it's the 2018-19 mystery kit. Kit. I'm as good of an actor as Jadon Shakiri. <laughs> you certainly are. Almost as good as Luis Suarez. you got a little work to do and you'll, and you'll get there. So the 2018-19 Mystery Kit, it's a similar deal except it's guaranteed to be from this current season. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the option... <laughs> Even Chelsea won't give you that offer. <laughs> you also have the option to go big or small. Okay. So you can ask for a 2018 To clarify, that's not size-wise. No, You're no. talking about the club that you can get. <laughs> yeah, size-wise yes. you can go small, medium, large, extra large, yes. and so on. You can ask for... I want a big one. You can ask for a big club uh-huh. mystery kit 2018-19. And I guess this is a good thing if you don't support a big club, mm-hmm. then you're not worried about getting your rivals or whatever, right? If you're, say, if you're a Wolves fan like me, I could I could do this and ask for a big club. I could get a Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea, Barca, Real Madrid, whatever kit. Yeah. The, confu- kind of the confusing thing is that you put the, the sixth best team in the Premier League in as a big club. But I take your point. I take your point. <laughs> I'm sure Mystery Kits would, would count them as a big club still. <laughs> I think um, so. The, the regular Mystery Kits are $25. Yep. These ones are $40. But you can also, again, ask for smaller Mystery Kit 2018-19. Um, again, smaller club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Got me very I'm self-conscious with you. about I'm with this you. now. Uh, for $40, and you'll get a current season mm-hmm. smaller club yeah. kit. And that could be like Monterey, I think is an example they give. Galatasaray mm. would be an example they give. So I would you... have been happy with Monterey about a year ago. I would certainly be happy with Galatasaray. All I, right. I, I would take that one myself. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. All kinds of other things going on in Away Days mm-hmm. Football.com. There's the American Kit Collection. Um, there's the All Sport hookup. Ul where Sport. They, they, uh, how do you pronounce it? I don't know. I think it's Ul Sport. Ul Sport. Yeah, so it's German teams that are manufactured Ul by uh, Ul Sport. They're normally mm-hmm. very expensive. They're a lot less um, at Away Days Football.com. Mm-hmm. And there's the whole Away Days brand, right? Mm-hmm. They're actual branded T-shirts hoodies all that sort of stuff at awaydaysfootball.com it is 90 degrees outside why not buy a hoodie yeah uh, but hey, yes. it's not 90 degrees everywhere just it's where true. you live I know we, we, we realized some that people we, live in Alaska when we saw all the people in Liverpool uh, yes. wearing thick coats uh, Daryl Daryl was concerned oh so I've this is a this just happened today I booked uh-huh. a trip home go mm-hmm. see my family for obvious reasons um, that was the one thing I didn't like about this Liverpool game is I just realized it is not 80 90 and sunny um, in England like it is here in Richmond, Virginia. What happens if you go back there and then you're there and Brexit happens and they won't let you leave? 
Have you considered that option at all? I have considered that. I, given the way Brexit's been going, I don't see it happening anytime soon. All right. All right. Well, we'll <laughs> see. But if Gerald never returns, he's stuck somewhere in England. <laughs> I've frozen in May. That's yes. what's happened. We've got a – what's that terrible – the terminal, the Tom Hanks movie yeah, where you're yeah, just yeah. stuck in the airport? That's you. Oh, that, you. that would be terrible at Gatwick. Uh, I hope, no good. Uh, hope, hope you enjoyed Recycle Air. <laughs> but if you enjoy discount codes, especially on Mystery Kits and all things offered at Away Days, uh, you can use one to get 15% off. Uh, use code TSS at awaydaysfootball.com for 15% off your order. We will put the link and the discount code in the show notes. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see? Okay, let's do it. I will. I mean, it's going to be me. I'll do it. That's fine. Um, all right, final thing on today's show. Mm. Updates from the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. Yes. We've, we're a little behind on this, right? We're a few days behind. I mean, so we're a few these... days behind on this document. Uh, we ran out of time last week is the full disclosure here. So some of these may have changed by the time you hear them. Okay, but they're or good. Or by the time we read them. They were good last week. Yes. And I think they're right. exciting because there's a lot of American players in sure. here, right? Would you mm. like to go first or would you like me to go first? Uh, you can go first. Why not? Okay. <laughs> You made me do that as I was hiccuping. Um, okay. We need a you code. Have asked. I need a, I need a hiccup code. I need time. I need time. All right. You know what it would have been? What? Why don't you go first? <laughs> I don't like to demand things. All right. First report today comes from... You, you think why don't you go first is a demand? I guess not. Um, Zachary Epstein, the first so report polite. today. Um, Julian Araujo, the mm. 17-year-old American defender for the LA Galaxy. Zachary says, last week, Julian made his MLS debut. I guess it's Julian. Right? Two weeks ago. Um, two weeks ago, made his MLS debut, filling in for an injured Rolf Felscher um, and going the full 90 in the Galaxy's 2-1 win over the Dynamo. It's been a rapid ascent for Araujo, who only joined LA Galaxy 2 late last season. Mm-hmm. Trevor Talbert scouting uh, Griffin Yao, 16-year-old American forward for DC United. After being in the squad for two matches in a row, Griffin Yao made his debut against NYCFC. Uh, he was given about five minutes at the end of what turned out to be a 2-0 loss for DC. Yao had a few good touches, but not much else. He has since, I think, gone to U17 qualifying, right? Oh, we'll be getting correct. updates all about that hopefully soon. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, we've probably already got them. Uh-huh. Um, Anurag Andrea is scouting Andrea Novakovic, the 22-year-old American forward on loan at Fortuna Sittard from Reading. Um, Novakovic was subbed off with a non-contact injury in the first half against fellow American Eric Palmer-Brown's Nack Breda. In other news, his parent club Reading has been facing financial trouble with a growing wage bill and falling revenues. That's not a good combo. Leading to a £28 million operating loss for That's this past definitely not a good season. Thing. With that plus Reading's poor domestic performance, they're currently 20 20th in their fifth straight championship season. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Novakovic move permanently to a new club next season. We shall see, because I think I also saw that Reading were not going to entertain offers for uh, Novak- Novakovic. That might just be posturing, but that might be them sort of being in this financial hole and not wanting to spend money this summer. So instead, they're going to see what they can with the players they've got. I'll also bet Novakovic not on big wages. Mm-hmm. Other players maybe have a higher sale value. Yep. So it's more like maybe they clear out and it makes room for Novakovic. Yeah. And they loan Matt Miazga again, and suddenly Reading have two very tall Americans. Best friends. Best American friends. They have 12 foot 8 of Americans next season. 12 foot 8 indeed. <laughs> Patrick Keeler scouting Anthony Robinson, 21-year-old American left back on loan at Wigan from Everton. Maybe he goes to Reading next season too. Yeah, send them all there to Reading. Yeah. Uh, after coming back from injury, Robert- you can commute to London. It's a nice place to live. Yeah. Yeah, that works for me. Uh, from, yeah, I guess Everton, yeah. Uh, uh, after coming back from injury, Robinson has started and finished every Wigan game since then. Uh, in the past two games, Anthony played very well on both ends of the field against Leeds. Robinson was singled out as one of the best players on the field, and the Guardian was quoted as saying he provided, quote, a master class in playing left back, end quote. Wow, all right. Ryan Marzak is getting Josh Onoma, the 21-year-old English midfielder on loan at Aston Villa from Tottenham. Ryan says Onoma made his first appearance since February when he started as a centre mid at Norwich. He didn't do anything spectacular in either match, but it's nice to see him back on the pitch. Mm-hmm. And he'll be involved in the uh, playoffs, obviously, for Villa, or at least will, Villa will be, maybe Onama, Onama yeah. will be too. Um, Willie Reed scouting Jesus Vallejo, the 22-year-old Spanish defender for Real Madrid. The prince who was promised made an appearance. Uh-oh. <laughs> Second reference on the show. Two princes, yeah. both promised. We know I don't read the scouting reports ahead of time, so you know, we know I didn't that. steal it from here. <laughs> uh, after a year completely decimated by injury, it wasn't decimated because it wasn't reduced by 10. Uh, it has become fi- a term used to not mean literally what it used Vallejo to mean. Vallejo finally got a start from Madrid against Athletic Bilbao and showed 
of what all the hype was about. He put Inaki Williams in his pocket the whole game. Is that and legal? showed well. I don't think so, but he went for it anyway. And showed uh, well in what has to be an audition for next year, as Edo Militao is already on the way in. All right. Eric Edston is scouting Callum Hudson-Odoi, the 18-year-old English winger for Chelsea. Ish. Unfortunately for Callum, his season ended during the first half of the 2-2 draw with Burnley, when he was first off with, forced off with an Achilles injury. He later confirmed reports of a ruptured Achilles Ow. and will be in a race to be fit for the start of next season, which may also lead to a quiet summer of transfer rumours. Mm-hmm. They can't sell him anyway. There's a transfer ban, so they can't afford to sell him because they can't replace Unless him. Unless they appeal. I still don't fully know what's going to happen with Chelsea if they're just going to embrace it and take the ban this summer or yeah. try to get the one more window of crazy spending. We shall see. Ryan Marzak scouting Pione Sisto, 24-year-old da- uh, Danish, wide I think he's da- yeah he's Danish yeah. wide attacker for Celta Vigo. Pione has not had a lot of opportunities to display his skills as of late. That's why I couldn't remember where he was from. He's made a total of six appearances since the transfer window closed at the end of January. This is very concerning as the summer window approaches, says Ryan. Not good. John Adams. Not good, says Daryl. John Adams, not that one, is mm-hmm. scouting Sean Harrison, the 21-year-old English striker on loan at Melbourne City from Spurs. He could have been the guy playing instead of Llorente. Um, John Adams says, Harrison had a breakout performance in Melbourne's 5-0 thrashing of last place Central Coast Mariners. He scored two goals and delivered a 91st-minute assist to put the cherry on top of the victory. The pick of the bunch was Harrison's first goal in which he drove at two defenders from the wing, split said defenders, avoid the onrushing third defender, and then finished around a fourth defender and passed the keeper to slot the ball into the far side netting. Fernando Llorente would have passed the ball backwards instead. He sure would have. That was dramatic. Guy Yerweb scouting Serge Gnabry, the 23-year-old wide forward for Bayern Munich. Bayern president Uli Hoeneß uh, labeled Serge Gnabry's Bayern the biggest surprise. Or he labeled Serge Gnabry Bayern's biggest surprise, saying, "Don't tell anyone, but we thought he might do a few games and occasionally help <laughs> yeah. the team." Uh, I feel like you're giving it away that you actually want that well shared. Uh, he also hailed Gnabry's positive attitude and energy, while Nico Kovac said he's happy Gnabry always wants to score, and Boateng called him a technical wizard equally strong with his left and right foot. A little surprised then that his contract has been extended until 2023. Oh, Germany, making all these players from England look as good as they should have been. <laughs> Dylan Viach scouting Kai Havertz, the 19-year-old German midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Kai started at right wing for the fourth straight game and scored in Leverkusen's 4-0 victory over Augsburg. Continuing to increase his hold on the title of Europe's top-scoring team, his 14th league goal was an amazing finish. Coming across the box from the right, he made it across. He just made it across the defender to meet Volans cross with his weak at right foot. Using the outside of his toe, he looped it across and over the keeper and into the far side net. I like how Dylan could tell it was the outside of his toe. He let slip the toe of war. That's what I have to say. Uh, Kyle of Michigan, formal, scouting Jonathan Gonzalez, 20-year-old Mexican midfielder from Monterey. This sounds like I love Michigan. Also that. (laughs) Kyle of – yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. That feels like it should be a terrible sitcom that Daryl would probably be a writer for, so it works out. Monterey uh, is not releasing Gonzalez. I would 100% quit this job to be a sitcom writer if I could be on staff and in a writer's room every day. I don't believe you. Because yeah. I feel like I feel like you do not enjoy being told what to do, and oh no, uh, yeah. network sitcom, you're getting tons of notes. I want to be the showrunner and self funded and make all my own decisions. Okay, yeah, yeah, and then so, you're John yeah. Mulaney, and well, that doesn't work. Oh, out either. can I stay then? Yes, can actually, stay on TSS? I'll still I'll still happily be John Mulaney, just maybe not <laughs> when it comes to bad Fox sitcoms. Um, Kyle of Michigan says Monterey is not releasing Gonzalez to play in the U20 World Cup, citing a need for a full squad for the upcoming Liga MX playoffs on April 7th. Gonzalez was injured in the 71st minute and left the pitch in Monterey's 5-1 loss to Toluca uh, after. Monterey had used all of their subs. Reported as a muscle injury, he then missed the next two uh, Liga Mekis and next two CONCACAF Champions League matches. Gonzalez returned to the starting 11 on April 27th. Oh, he's going to be all mad that he can't go to the U20 World Cup, right? Shucks. Chase Paul is scouting Gedson Fernandez, the 20-year-old Portuguese midfielder for Benfica. Um, even though Gedson has uh, been only getting, quote, garbage minutes, unquote, and a single assist in the Europa League of last month, a rumor has emerged that Tottenham has offered Benfica 45 million euros for him, which Benfica have refused. This is much below his 120 million euro release clause. Slightly. Hard to say that what he's actually worth since he hasn't played much the second half of the year, but it's way less than 120 million. I think I read a rumor today that Man City are after him as well. Of course. Yeah. Of course. 
That, that I think, sounds right. I may have him confused with someone else, but yeah. I think there's been a lot of rumors about who Man City are going after, and the answer is a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, like. they need to strengthen after winning every game in the Premier League this year. <laughs> Steve Renard, scouting Yuri Tielemans, 21-year-old Belgian midfielder on loan at Leicester from I Monaco. Know, I know they haven't won every game. Please don't email me. Go ahead and email him. Tielemans opened the scoring for Leicester once again, using his head to deftly redirect a ball from James Madison into the Arsenal net in the 49th minute. Yuri. That was in their 3-0 win. He narrowly missed uh, with a well-taken shot in the 73rd as well, but sadly was not involved in the acrobatic Vardy goal later on, which Kasper Schmeichel got the assist for. Todd Ito is scouting Takafusa Kubo, the 17-year-old Japanese attacker for FC Tokyo. Todd says Kubo continues to be linked to big European clubs like PSG, Barcelona, and Real Madrid. However, when asked by Goal.com what his favourite European side is, he said, quote, the team I think played the most interesting football is Liverpool. It's a visionary. I feel they are awesome when I watch their games. It's not... <laughs> he's such a kid. <laughs> it's not really to say that they are my, quote, favourite unquote but more like quote awesome unquote on the pitch Kubo's kind of enjoyed that as well, by FC the way. Tokyo remains atop the J-League table and he played the full 19 had the assist and the first goal in the most recent match against uh, Matsumoto Yamaga on April 28th uh, I know you watch a lot of SNL I'm gonna nickname Takafusa Kubo Chad <laughs> <laughs> Takafusa Chad Kubo and I'm good with that why uh, do you, have you watched all the Chad sketches where Pete Davidson is just like cool all right oh yeah yes, yes. <laughs> yeah like there's like awesome I can see. <laughs> Who's your favorite team? Liverpool. Why? Awesome. But why are they awesome? Awesome. Uh, Axel Romain scouting Nathaniel Chalaba, the 24-year-old English midfielder for Watford. Chalaba has only played eight minutes since January. That's not a lot. And has only made the bench four times in that period. He has not been dealing with any injuries, so question mark is what I'm going to say about Chalaba. <laughs> Thank you to everybody mm-hmm. for all the scouting reports. Apologies sincerely for us being a little delayed on them. Um, we should be up to date by the end of the week. Should be. Right? We should be. Inshallah. In the Turkish sense. Uh, all right. Just remain to say, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, you've been fine. Listeners, thank you for listening. We know other soccer podcasts are available. We're very happy that you listen to ours. And we will be back tomorrow to review Ajax v Spurs.